Hello, BookTube. I've got a little mail haul for you today on a lovely but warm day here in Billings. And as warm as it is, it's going to get warmer. The next two days, triple digits. Maybe even a chance that those triple digits will linger, that they'll be stubborn to move out. I mean, Montana is going to get relief uh, next week. Uh, but boy, oh boy, <laughs> we're going to have to suffer for it first. Keep in mind... Uh, that 90 degrees Fahrenheit, with maybe high humidity, is a very different thing from 105 degrees Fahrenheit, which we could likely see on Friday and Saturday. Uh, it's much worse. It's, it's exponentially more dangerous for your body. So take it easy, stay hydrated, stay out of the sun, don't exert yourself in the middle of the day. You young people thinking you're going to go to a tennis court in the middle of a day when it's 104 degrees? Bad idea. And you only have to make that mistake once, so don't do it. Keep in mind that uh, actual heat paralysis, actual heat stroke is not remediable. You'll just die of it. Uh, but anyway, <clears throat> we're all going to have to take it easy here in Billings for the next couple of days. And then we'll get a little bit of relief, cool in the morning. And uh, yes, I know, you old timers are saying, well, I'll gladly take two days of triple digit temperatures considering what the winter's going to be like. We'll see what the winter's like. Uh, but in the meantime, we have a couple of packages of mail, just like yesterday. We've got a periodical and a couple of packages of mail. The periodical could not be any more melancholy for yours truly. Uh, it's the New Yorker. It's the August 5th. Yeah, the August 5th issue of the New Yorker with this, this lovely cover. Uh, but it is my last issue of the New Yorker, and that is pretty melancholy, considering that I've been with this magazine for a long, long time. <laughs> uh, I will say... The New Yorker, of course, doesn't know. <laughs> they, of course, don't know. Uh, I, I made a gesture of leaving them once before, about 20 years ago. And someone at the New Yorker took it personally. They, they did not want that to happen. They saw the length of my subscription and did not want that to happen. I doubt that will happen now. I doubt that there's anyone there, uh, that anyone cares at all. Uh, but the issue, I couldn't help but, see, but view it as a kind of send-off, so I looked at it that way. And it had both things that would keep me reading The New Yorker and things that wouldn't. Uh, Pleasant Surprises, for instance. Nell Freudenberger is a, a modern literary fiction author that I don't tend to like. She wrote a short story for this called Attila, in which uh, a woman's older mother takes an unreasoning hatred of uh, a pet rabbit named Attila. <laughs> and I thought it was quite good. Very atmospheric, very convincing. Uh, probably going a long way to substantiating my theory that one of the reasons that I don't like a lot of so-called purveyors of literary fiction today is because they're really short story writers. They're, they've been Adderall since they were four years old. They don't have an attention span, so they can't write a novel. And uh, we've seen that over and over and over again. Plot lines dropped. The whole novel dropped. <laughs> every, every piece of so-called literary fiction that I read simply comes to a stop. It doesn't end. There's no satisfaction. There's no res resolution of any kind to anything. It just stops. Uh, and I've even seen some young modern writers claim that that's an artistic choice, uh, but that's ridiculous. It's just that they don't have an attention span. They don't have the ability to write a novel. Short stories, though? Often I am pleased with short stories by authors whose novels do not please me. Uh, also, there's a long article in here about sharks uh, for the, the first day of August. Uh, always always an enjoyable thing but there are also negatives Anthony Lane the in-house movie critic who uh, I stopped reading when he put pornography in one of his movie reviews of a children's movie uh, was not disciplined by the New Yorker was not give, it was not that beat the movie beat was not removed from him he wasn't relegated to writing uh, in brief segments at the front of the magazine uncredited no, no he was just kept on in his birth uh, open perversion open you know, uh, pederasty, and he was just kept on in his job. Uh, and he's in this issue. He's not reviewing a movie or a TV show or anything like that. Instead, he's doing something worse. He's, he writes a long, fawning profile about the Republican National Convention and Donald Trump. And gets off a lot of his signature one-liners, but the ultimate essence of his piece is, you gotta hand it to Donald Trump. And to paraphrase Twitter, you do not, under any circumstances, have to, have to hand it to Donald Trump. 
he talks about the spectacle of it and how these people they might they might be a little odd they're not a little odd <laughs> they're not a little odd they want to enslave women and overthrow democracy you don't have to walk more than two feet at the republican national convention to get talked about to get talked to about those things directly by the people in the audience in order for our boy to wander through that audience and come away with this profile he had to do a lot of not listening and that that is typical of what his his unbelievably cynical approach to movies became so i have his anthology on my shelf but i won't be sorry to say goodbye to him at all uh there was also uh there were also letters uh the magazine just recently did a profile of norm mclean the author of a river runs through it and the, there are two letters about him one is by john bryant who's a, a professor at hofstra university in chicago a warm anecdote about how they knew each other and he he worked with McLean and proofreading a river runs through it uh, but the other one is from uh, Oxford and uh, it's a little more telling I, I the, the New Yorker Denver does replies to letters they don't have ongoing snipe fest like the London Review of Books for instance uh, but I can't help but think this is gonna hit home with the author of that piece the author of the piece is Catherine Schultz who's very good and I can't help but th I think that this letter is gonna hit home with her uh, the author writes, I knew Norman McLean pretty well, enough to know that his biographer, Rebecca McCarthy, knew him far better. Unusually for a biographer, she herself plays a prominent role in her life of him. But this seems justified because of their closeness and because it also demonstrates the respectful attention he paid to women students, not often the case for male professors of his day, as well as his charismatic talents as a legendary teacher. Certain details about McLean's life that appear in Schultz's article can only be found in McCarthy's biography. To find this source so crucial and then effectively dismiss it, its quality in one sentence is unpleasant. Uh, so you, if you get what's going on there, the author is very sotto voce su suggesting that Catherine Schultz plagiarized a lot of the stuff from that particular biography of Norman McLean and then dismissed the whole thing by saying that it's not that it's minor unpleasant here is a very intentional understatement of what's being said in the letter if that had been written to the New York Review of Books it would spark three months of correspondence and maybe a lawsuit no idea what's gonna come of this uh, but in true New Yorker fashion the thing that I was paying attention to here were the cartoons I'm a big connoisseur of New Yorker cartoons. Uh, these are not the last New Yorker cartoons that I will ever see because people often, the New Yorker often posts them on, just free on, on social media. Uh, but one of them that I really liked is this, the classic New Yorker uh, template of someone being interrupted in bed. Here a man is being interrupted in bed. There's the dog at the foot of the bed. And the caption is, I hired you to work full time and here I find you at home at night asleep in your bed. <laughs> And I find that funny in the way that all the best New Yorker cartoons are, uh, in that it is also eerie. It's also very eerie. Because in the, in the 21st century, that is closer to being true than it ever has been. I don't know how many of you uh, have workplaces or bosses that uh, kind of sort of verge towards making that cartoon a reality. I would hope none. I would hope none. I would hope that you draw a firm line uh, and that your boss does not have your home email address, that your boss does, is not able to contact you, or if your boss ever does contact you on your off time, you read them the riot act and hang up on them. I would like to think that that would be true. Again, as with so many other encroachments everywhere in our daily life in America, most of it happens because people allow it to happen. They don't draw the line. They don't draw a line anywhere. And that is weird. That is really weird. I don't understand that at all. So that, for instance, in work relationships, your boss will think nothing of calling or emailing you at 10 at night about work. And they, they might sugarcoat it by saying, I know, I know, I know. The day we had, the last person you want to hear from is me. But I've just got this one thing. Uh, if, and pl as plenty of Americans will get that, they'll grouse about it, but they'll do it. They'll comply with it. Instead of saying, don't email me at this hour again. I will deal with this first thing in the morning when I'm at work. Don't do it again, or I'll quit that same day. <laughs> no, Americans don't do that. And, or, or 
you're out on the subway or on a bus, you see someone being incredibly rude to someone else, you don't speak up. Just don't say anything. And why? Because it's incremental. Because they might have a gun and go on a shooting spree and you might be the cause of it and the very first victim of it. Or in online culture, thankfully not on this channel, but an online culture, not much on this channel, in online culture, it is staggering amounts of rudeness are just accepted. They're just, we just accept them. The, the way someone is going to say hi is to refer to you as a mass murderer. <laughs> They're going to say, well, you know, I think you're a total imbecile and you got everything wrong and you really don't know what you're talking about and you really ought to be dead. So hi anyway. Uh, you know, here's my channel. <laughs> it always amazes me. Absolutely amazes me. Just, I say it doesn't happen on this channel and it doesn't. It's, by, it's, so, it's so rare that it's freakish. Yesterday some anonymous drive-by troll left a comment on a recent video of mine. I don't, I tend not to look at comments on videos that aren't recent. Because everybody's always finding your videos, and if, you, if you're responding to older comments, uh, new comments on older videos, you will never stop commenting, if you have as many videos as I do. Somebody did a drive-by troll comment on one of my videos. It's the simple word liar. That's all. Just the simple word liar. So, you don't think I'm real. You're not real. You don't care what I'm saying. You don't care if I care what you're saying. You just wanted a minuscule dopamine hit of lobbing a, an insult at a stranger. So I removed it. No reason for it to be there. But yesterday I also got a condescending comment from someone just blandly, calmly, professorially telling me, well, little Timmy, your, your greatest books of all time, eh, you got this wrong, and you got that wrong, and you got this wrong. But the slightest hint of awareness that I am older than they are and probably know what I'm talking about. Not the slightest hint of awareness. And the only reason that you do that is if you think that the person receiving that comment is not real. You would never do that in your personal life. And the only reason that people feel comfortable making those comments is because they don't get pushback. Because we just accept it. And so I wonder if that cartoon is real for some of you. And uh, if it is, feel free to email me because we need to change that fact. If, as, as, the dude bro, as my dude bro brethren say, if you don't value yourself, no one else will. <laughs> but the other, the other New Yorker cartoon, probably my favorite New Yorker cartoon in months, uh, is this one. It does not have a caption. <laughs> you got to let it sink in on you for a minute. It's two bees playing chess. They're both guarding their queens, and there are no other pieces, just pawns. <laughs> there are just drones on the board, and they're both guarding their pieces. <laughs> they're guarding their queens, and that's it. I'm sorry that this was shrunk so small and put so far in the back of the issue, because I thought that was great. It's the only thing from this issue. Aside from uh, the Freudenberger short story, this is the only thing that I'll be saving <laughs> This and also the cover of my final New Yorker issue. So that was that was, it was just a treat to leave it smiling. I might actually save the shark thing as well. Uh, but anyway, that was the New Yorker. That was the periodical. And then we have a couple of packages. And they are dis disappointingly slight. Uh, I thought that Montana mailmen were made of sterner stuff. But uh, they were not, they're not having heavy packages here to the ranch. Uh, so let's see what this first one is. Okay, that's gross. That's an invoice. <laughs> I'm not paying for my books. Uh, let's see here. Okay, this comes out in July. So this is late getting to me. Uh, oh, it has a sheet as well. Good. All right, this is late getting to me. I can read this tonight. This is uh, by Anthony Stefano, and it's called Bar Broadway Butterfly. The Lady Gangster of Jazz Age New York. Vivian Gordon, The Lady Gangster of Jazz Age New York. Uh the shocking, violent death of a high-end escort would lead to the unraveling of New York City's corrupt political machine known as Tammany Hall. It started with the brutal murder of a savvy, sharp call girl, Vivian Gordon, who parlayed her little black book of high-profile names, including politicos and gangsters, into a lucrative blackmailing scheme. Dumped by Van Cortlandt Park in the Bronx, her shocking murder would reveal a bigger, more complex shakedown racket. New York City's magistrate court system, where court officials and cops would force hundreds of women to make payoffs to have their cases dropped or forgotten. Oh, wow. Fantastic. All right. So uh, the author is New York Newsday's Pulitzer Prize winning crime reporter. And here he is writing about a bygone era. So all of you people who, uh, 
really like the Black Dahlia, for instance, you're going to want to read this thing, obviously. If he's a, if he's a, a ordinarily noticed, I would say you're going to want to read this if it's good. But if he's a, a practiced crime journalist, that means he has a lot of experience in writing prose that works to please its readers. It's one of the things you can count on in the journalistic world, or that you could before the 21st century. So I think I can count on this being an entertaining read, and I guess I will read it uh, tonight. Oh, wait. Okay, the back of the book says that the, the on-sale date is mid-June, late June, and the, the spine says July. What about the sheet itself? Late, uh, no, <laughs> no, the, the pub sheet said late June. The spine says July, so there, there may be uncertainty here. The, the pub date may be changing, so I will look this up. Uh, I'll read it tonight anyway. It'll go on the pile tonight because it's, it's maybe out already. Uh, then we've got this, this second package, and then we'll be done. Uh, it's a finished copy of something. Uh, what have we got here? Okay, this is a finished copy. This is due in two weeks, August 13th. I think we saw this already. This is Fiona McFarland's book, Highway 13, a collection of stories uh, from the author of The Sun Walks Down. Uh, let's see here. Uh, okay, we've got blurbs from the LA Times and book list, but those are of her novel. Uh, let's see here. In the small town of Barrow, Australia, people go about their ordinary lives. They drive to work through the dense state forest. They raise their families, they flirt and yearn, they lie and confess. Some of them leave home, some of them return. Darkness thrums beneath the surface of these ordinary lives. The violence of one man, a serial killer whose murders made Barrow infamous. You know, there's a serial, there's a, not a serial killer, but a family annihilator article in that New Yorker issue about Whiteside Farms. And here we have a serial killer. I can't get away from the subject, no matter how much I try. His 12 victims, women, men, mostly young, are long gone, but their deaths are felt beyond the forest where they were buried, beyond this country, even beyond this time. In the past, where a young woman on a school trip to Rome sees something she shouldn't have, in the present, where a man confronts an ancient grief on a suburban streets of Texas, in the future, in the hands of journalists and podcast hosts and television actors whose livelihoods hinge on the twin spectacles of loss and violence. Okay, you could tell me a little more here. This is good. It's good copy, but it's it's not specific. A little detail about how, what's connecting these people. You don't have to give the book away. Uh, but this is a connection to short stories, so uh, does this run through all of them? Uh, Highway 13 is a luminous wonder. Okay, well, uh, settle down there, Seymour. Uh, a book about the collisions between public and private selves, between parents and children, between history and what comes after, between the living and the dead. Okay, but, all right, but it's, it says stories. So is, are the stories connected? Is this a short story connection, a connected short story is telling the larger story of the aftermath of a serial killer? Or is that just one story? Uh, I don't know. I guess I'll have to read the book to find out. It's only two weeks away. I could put both of these on my list for tonight. And what about Fiona McFarland? Shall we read about her? Who is she when she's at home? Uh, she's the author of The Night Guest, The High Places, and uh, The Sun Walks Down, which was a big hit in the literary fiction circles at Cantab Lounge. Uh, and her short story has, fiction has been published in The New Yorker and Zoetrope All Story. And she teaches at the University of California, Berkeley. Okay, well, I, I, I don't get much clarity as to what the book is, but I'm all for it. So, so nonfiction and fiction for the mail hall. Uh, two slight things. This, this together is two hours reading for me, so... I think I'll probably put both of these on my list uh, for tonight. Lots of other stuff to read tonight. Lots and lots of it. Uh, but that's the mail for today. In a day here in Billings that feels warm, but Friday and Saturday, oh my. And I would argue Sunday as well. I bet Sunday as well. I don't think this temperature is going to drop off a cliff. Next week's going to feel like the Garden of Eden. But before we get there, we have to go through the furnace. So, uh, so I will wrap this up for now and go and relax. <laughs> but I will see you soon. Thank you, Booktube.